extravaganza. Fun to say and fun to play. Now that's an everyday win. Play the $173 million extravaganza scratcher for your chance to win up to $5 million or 670,000 prizes ranging from $100 to $500. Everyday win. Are you win? Visit a lottery retailer near you. For odds and more information, visit VALottery.com. Welcome to the Busted Open Podcast. This is the Busted Open Podcast. You can listen to the full show Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to noon Eastern on Sirius XM Fight Nation Channel 156. Welcome to the Busted Open Podcast. This is Dave LaGreca and a very special edition of the Busted Open Podcast as we talk about Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor, as everybody knows, after final battle this past weekend is on hiatus. But when you think of Ring of Honor, you don't just think of what we saw this past Saturday night. You think of the last... 18 years, 19 years of Ring of Honor. And when you think of Ring of Honor, when you think of what's going on presently, when you think of what's gone on the last 10 years, what's gone on the last 19 years, you think of one man. And for me, that man is our guest right now here on the Busted Open Podcast, and that is Kerry Silke. Kerry, how are you this morning? Well, well, I'm well. And thank you for having me on. And yesterday, uh, the the your normal nine to twelve a.m. EST busted open show. It was really nice to hear the various tributes, comments, uh, the whole you know the yesterday your show yesterday sort of was the same vibe as uh, in Baltimore because there's such a range of emotions. Yeah, and. Uh, um, a lot of, you know, there was a big, I'm going to go to the, the white, what could the white elephant in the room be? The white elephant in the room is that, oh, why is this ring of honor going out of business? And I really don't, you know, yes, it's really easy to say it could have been managed better. Of course you could say, and it could have been, but, but so could Sirius XM. I mean, they're not closing. So. Um, I just want to say real quick, you know, things were far from perfect. They never are. But uh, I'm grateful that Joe Koff kept it alive as long as he did. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people like to point fingers. And I think, Carrie, even now here in 2021, as we inch closer to 2022, everybody wants to think of one thing or one person or one event that people can point to and say, that's the reason why we're here or we're, or this has happened. And you can't do that. I think, you know, there's never just one person or one event or one instance that makes something happen. It's a collection of things that possibly happen. There is one road that you might've gone down where you decide to go down another road and it leads to a completely different path. But I don't think even when you look at ring of honor, there's one reason why the company is in a situation that it's in right now. Right. So we're not going to harp on it. Uh, but, I, in, 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 but just, in closing on that line of thinking, we never got live TV. That was, you know, and, and, you know, when the blame game is going around and it's not, I'm not just talking about with, you know, just in general, um, I don't hear anyone talking about the pandemic because we were, we were after the, uh, after 2000 and, Boy, the years get mixed up. Going into 2020, we were going to be on some form of weekly live broadcasting. It might have been on a cable network. It might have been on YouTube, but something in a uniform style. And that's what Joe was was aiming for. But due to the pandemic, it didn't happen. And uh Let's talk about some good times. When it comes to finding the right protein for your muscle growth and recovery goals, the options can be dizzying. Protein is the essential building block for a healthier you. But how can you be sure it's high quality and tasty enough to take regularly? Problem solved. Meet Body Tech from the Vitamin Shop. Body Tech is the authority on ultra premium protein with more than 50 types, sizes, 
and innovative flavors like chocolate peanut butter, cinnamon cereal, and fruity cereal at vitaminshop.com. Plus, new options are added throughout the year, including limited edition flavors you won't find anywhere else. Every Body Tech purchase is backed by an unbeatable quality promise for purity and potency that you can trust. You can even get it delivered right to your doorstep through Instacart in as little as one hour. Bonus! The Vitamin Shop semi-annual sale is on right now. It's BOGO 50%, B-O-G-O 50% off their entire family of brands, including Body Tech. No matter what level you're at, there's no limit to how strong and fit you can be. So stop by and save huge. Score the perfect protein at vitaminshop.com or the Vitamin Shop store near you. Yeah, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because the reason why I asked you on today is not to talk about what happened or why it happened. It's about the history and the rich history of Ring of Honor because that's really what I wanted to talk about. Honestly, Carrie, that's what I wanted to talk about uh, on Busted Open as well. And then you find yourself in a rabbit hole for one reason or another. But uh, I really just wanted to talk about how much Ring of Honor is meant to a lot of people, myself included. I've said it many times on Busted Open. If it wasn't for Ring of Honor, I wouldn't be doing Busted Open. Uh, if, if it wasn't for Ring of Honor, I don't know if I'd still be How a so? fan. Because I don't know if I would still be a fan. of Well, number one, there's a couple reasons. But the reason number one is because I don't know if I would still be a big fan of pro wrestling if it wasn't for Ring of Honor. Uh, okay. I love DCW. I love WCW. I wasn't the biggest WWF slash WWE guy. I've said that many times. Uh, and when those two companies went away and were dissolved and made it to be a part of the WWE, uh, my interest went to other things in pro wrestling, and one being Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor came at the perfect time in 2002. I think they filled a void that a lot of things that were missing because even at that point, the WWE was high money, high production, and I always, just like my music, I like my wrestling a little bit underproduced, a, a, a little bit forbidden, a little bit outside the box. And Ring of Honor was able to do that. It was raw. It was in your face. And it was the perfect product for, the, for its time. But not just that. It also brought back the spirit of pro wrestling that I fell in love with the sport to begin with. It kind of reminded me of mid-80s NWA where it was a sport. It was competitive. Uh, there was a code of honor that, that they uh, uh, heard to. So to me, it had all the elements of the things that I fell in love with pro wrestling to begin with. I think we were, I think we're in the same boat. Even though <clears throat> I'm uh, 15 years older than you, I too, as a lifelong wrestling fan, when the uh, had my peaks and valleys, but I always kept my eye on it. As uncool as it was, as a kid in in the in the seventies and in eighties, and I'd have to find like one of my friends. Sometimes couldn't always find that friend that would that would go with me to Madison Square Garden or go with me. Oh, they're running at Seton Hall, you know, it's, it, it, locally to my house. And uh, but came it came the early nineties. I mean, it's been beaten to death, but. WCW was certainly subpar, especially as you just mentioned, what we had seen with the NWA, mm -hmm. you know, in the, the Crockett days, the, the, you know, the 89 period with steamboat and flair. And it, it just fell into a, a, an abyss and WWE was even worse with that whole cartoon era yep. uh, for lack of a better way to put it. And so just like you, I gravitated to ECW. And I remember going to ECW. You know, the first show I went to was, was because the, the original Sheik was there, right? I, I forget how it went, but it was I, maybe, maybe the Sheik with Sabu again, I, whatever. But it was the Sheik. So I went and I, I went back. First time I went to ECW, Dave, I guess it was Eastern Championship Wrestling. There was just a few hundred people there. But I stuck with it and... Uh, they started blossoming into what they became. And I loved it. 
um, it, it revitalized my my love of wrestling. I, I didn't particularly care for six matches that everyone was bleeding, but they had the, the, the they had the Guerreros, they had the Dean Malenkos also, they had the Chris Jerichos also, and uh, Super Crow, whoever. I, oh, there's a, there's a lot of good wrestling. They they uh, would recognize history. I was there the night that I think it was Bobby Eaton and someone else came out of a box. I can't remember exactly, but when it when ECW went away, I was in the same boat with you. And as you know, and if anybody wants to hear the full story, because we're not going to tell it, it's all available on my podcast, Last Stop Penn Station. But I knew the guys, Gabe Sapolsky, Doug Gentry, and the other guy who um, – I knew them from ECW. Remember they had the, the, the Gabe worked for uh, Gabe was outside selling programs, you know, worked for Paul E and I got to know him a little. And uh, the other guys were, had a little uh, videotape stand. Remember? Yep. Yep. <laughs> so since I was usually by myself, it's too bad. I didn't know you back then. I could have <laughs> had a friend. <laughs> so I would, I would talk to those guys. Well, when ECW closed up, I had a very good feeling that these guys were going to um, open a wrestling company. And I approached them. My intuition was correct. I approached them and uh, they didn't need my help. You know, uh, everything was cool. So um, I went, I was there. Were you at the first Ring of Honor show? Yes, I was. So was I. See, we could have had another. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But yeah, so, um, and I was like, look at this, because I wasn't an expert on Japanese wrestling or an expert on the Southern California independence scene or the, the California independence scene. So guys like Daniel, Christopher Daniels, Samoa Joe, uh, young Brian Kendrick, Paul London, we could go down the list. Um, this, but I knew what the kind of wrestling I like, and there it was, right back in my lap. And you know what? You go back to that first show in Philadelphia, um, and it just I, I, it brings you back instantly because I just remember it was freezing that day, February. <laughs> yeah, um, which you don't want to be in in Philly on in February, but also too, you reminded me of something in January of. 91 I saw Flair and Sting at the Meadowlands and I couldn't find a friend to go with me and I actually went by myself in the middle of a snowstorm but but it but as we talked about it filled it filled that void uh, and then you became a part of something that and you took it to Carrie again much respect you took that company to a completely uh different level to the point where even in this last show that we saw this past weekend you're there with the champion. I said it on Busted Open that, you know, everybody talks about NXT and Triple H always posing with whatever right. NXT wrestler won a championship. My my memories of every champion that's crowned, you're in the ring with that champion. Um, Give him the belt. Yep. And, of course, you brought Jethro Tull into the world of Ring of Honor as well. Uh, Not to mention, I, I hate to interrupt you, but... It, it's forgotten about. If you watch the 2002 and early 2003 shows, which are filmed horribly uh, with low quality cameras, and but there was one pro, there was the, the biggest problem that I saw. And you're a rock and roll guy. There was zero production. There was zero lighting. And once I became involved on a financial level, I went up to Gabe Sapolsky who his favorite band is Rush, right? Yeah. And, you know, he's a, he's a big rock and rolling guy. Went to, a, went to go to a lot of shows. And I know we've spoken about this before, but I said, Gabe, we got to bring in some ring lightings and a half-ass entranceway with some lights. He's like, Carrie, and this is still at the Murphy Rec. He's like, Carrie, I don't want you to, you know, blow a lot of money. I, I said, it's got to be done right. It can't be a couple, you know, we got to get like a, a lighting company and just just basic ring lights and where you could turn them up and down and, and one follow spotlight. And the other thing, Dave, was the barriers, the metal barriers. I was watching Raw one night 
And I noticed they had, instead of the classic bicycle uh, rack barriers for the front row, they had solid black barriers. And I'm like, hmm. And I went to Sid, who was, you know, ran the office. And we came up with these, with those metal tinnish barricades. And we weren't thinking this at the time, but holy shit, 80 people banging those (laughs) at once made a hell of a noise. So you throw in the lights, you throw in the barriers. As the time went on and we were able to, we upgraded the lighting. We And so once we did the show in Philly with lights, we were going to Boston a month later and we had to find a lighting company up there. There was no turning back. And that that part of Ring of Honor is never spoken about because it's like it's like subconscious. When you're at Alice Cooper or Kiss and there's a huge break in a song and all the lights had been red and blue, but suddenly they're gold and white and just on bang. It's like it's subconscious. No one's saying, oh, look, now they're gold and white. But you, you feel it. Yep. So when a, when a Ring of Honor show would start, like I told Gabe, think about it. What happens when a movie starts? What happens when Rush starts? Oh, the lights go out. All right. And uh, so that that was a big help, along with the incredible talent that was in there at the time. Well, and we'll and we'll get into uh, we'll get into the talent because there's a lot of talent that went in and out of the doors of Ring Ring of Honor. Um, but you, you're right about. You're right about the the production, the lighting, because uh, I always kind of compare Ring of Honor to rock and roll. Like you could still be a club band, you could still be a small theater band, but put on a production that was like what you were able to do with Ring of Honor. And you're so right about the barricade. It may sound so small and simple, but that's what made the fans such a big part of the show because they were so vocal and the banging on that barricade, that tin barricade, when something big happened, there was a big moment. You know, now it's the chance, but with the Ring of Honor show, it was the banging, the hands banging on that barricade. And and it also made it available that only 80 people can be banging. You have to have a front row seat. So you could raise the the front row price a little bit because you wanted to be able to be in front, to to be front row, and to bang the damn barricade. Yep. No, you're right. And, and again, like for me as a fan, you, you, you talked about Philadelphia and, and you talked about the Murphy rec center, you know, my, my memories of going to Edison, New Jersey, uh, uh, basketball city, you know, the New Yorker hotel, like you saw the progress. And that's all. Awesome. That's another thing too. Like when you're a fan of a band and you see a band or you discover a band in a club, and then you see the progression of that band to bigger venues to the, to the get to the, re- I felt that with ring of honor, like here I am like at the beginning of something that I know is going to be very, very special and just see year by year, event by event, how the venues would get bigger. The events would get bigger and the buzz around ring of honor would get bigger. That show you just referenced in New York city, which was the Samoa Joe, um, Kabashi match. Yes. That was our first I think Basketball City came after that, and I'll tell you why. We had, we were dying to get into the city, but it was too too damn expensive, right? So the guy that ran the Rexplex, remember the Rexplex when Rexplex went out of business? Say that three times fast. <laughs> uh, remember that though? Yes. The Rexplex suddenly we, we're like, oh no, because the Rexplex was a great location. You know, tw- twenty minutes on the train, easy, whatever. So the guy that was like the building manager of the Rexplex, he had gotten a gig. There was an armory in Washington Heights, and it was a good neighborhood. You know, it's Washington Heights. Well, no, no, no. It's like right off the George Washington Bridge. It was an old soccer building, a multi-purpose. It was way too big for us. I mean, you could have held, you could have held a tr- Dave, you could have held a track meet in it. Anyway, that's what it was built for. Anyway. We were, he says, look, we'll, we'll charge you, a, you know, a, a modest amount of money. We're just trying to get some events in here. Put it in the corner. I'm like, 
the size of this place. It was like, it looked like, you know, you were at Javits Center. Yeah. So we booked the building and approximately, and that was going to be the, the, the Joe Kabashi. And two weeks before the date, tickets had been sold. Um, two weeks before the date, the guy calls us. There were there were various permits from the city that hadn't come through. Maybe they didn't pay their bills. Who knows? But we had no building. And do you remember who came to the rescue? No. Who? Nana. Prince Nana. Wow. Nana ran, you know, he was on break from his Guiana, uh, his <laughs> career as a dignitary. And he was in New York. Now, and and I was happy to see Nana on AEW, the dark, the other night. Good for good for him. But Nana ran around the city. And he's going to these the ballroom at the Hilton, the ballroom at the Sheraton. He checks the Beacon Theater. I'm like, Nana, what is can't forget it. But and he checks the Hammerstein. Way too expensive. But the people at the Hammerstein told him, well, look. So Nana was like, well, what about that upstate? We told them, ask them about the Manhattan Center. Too expensive. And they said, but you know what? In the old hotel, what was it? The New Yorker? The New Yorker, yeah. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a ballroom. Holds about 500 people. And the price was right up our alley. And that's how we, we were, that was our first time in New York. And, you know, I'll bring up Sid again. I mean, the place was 500 people capacity with fire hazard. But, you know, in, in those days, the New York fire uh, commissioners were, were, were happy to take a few dollars and go away. <laughs> wow. So we wound up having like 700 people. But um, and I'm often asked, I'm going off track here, but I'm often asked what my favorite match is. And I always have if I have to pick one. It was the Joe Kabashi. Yeah. And the atmosphere in that building, you were there. I, I was there. It's Incredible. it's on my top 10 list of all-time favorite matches ever, in my opinion, right. that match. You watch the match uh, on on the video. It was, Gabe, Gabe was smart. There was no announcing. And there's me and Mike G at the bell, straight ahead. And uh, talk about the big fight feel. But that's just one of many, many, many great moments. Yeah, and you mentioned Mike G, and I have to, again, and I try to do this as much as possible, give a shout-out to Mike G, who was the PR director in those early years of Ring of Honor. And he did an amazing job of not only getting the talent out there, but also getting the talent to want to be out there. Uh, I always tell the story of Austin Aries. When he was with Ring of Honor, uh, at the time he was living in Philly, and he drove from Philly to the Sirius XM studios. At that time, they weren't even Sirius I XM. I had to meet him. Dig this. I had to meet him. He was in his car. He was with a girl. I think that Lacey girl, maybe. But anyway, he's coming out of the Lincoln Tunnel. This is pre-GPS-ish. And I'm like, listen, where are you? I'm coming out of the tunnel. I, you know, And you know there's different. Yeah. I go, go uptown. And I met him on the corner of 42nd and 9th, and 42nd, it, it runs into 42nd. And I said, I'll be on that corner. He's like, Where? I, just go as far as you can go without turning. And, you know, uh, so, yeah, and, and I got him over to, to your event, to, to that broadcast. And that was, geez, that was 2000, I think that was 2004, maybe 2005. That's how far back that was, because I remember it was like the early days of, of, of serious radio. And I remember him getting there and he came on the morning show. He went on the, the morning NFL show to talk Ring of Honor and to talk about the Green Bay Packers he was a fan of. And then Carrie, he wound up staying there like the whole day because he's like, it took me forever to get here. So I might as well just like hang. And he went on multiple shows that day and 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 uh, my producer Andre reminded me it was October of 2005 thank you I remember it, it was way back then but that was such great and and I'm just bringing it up because Mike G got it he understood the importance of getting the wrestlers out there getting the getting the name brand out there and I thought it was extremely successful 
those early years of Ring of Honor. Was it? Talk about a little. We'll, we'll mix a little ROH history with a little uh, Dave Lagreca uh, history. Wasn't? Didn't myself, CM Punk, and Nana come to your show early on? Or, or early on, you came. You came up to Sirius, and you yes, you you, you and Nana and Nana was actually the first guest ever on Busted Open was Prince Nana. And again, you know, so that, I mean, that's, I gotta, I gotta give him a call because he's a part of this show's history, but he was the first ever guest on the first ever uh, episode of Busted Open because and, Mike and this, G is the one. And, and again, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Mike G was one right. was like, cause I was like a part of the NFL. I was doing NFL. So I would, even though some of the guys weren't wrestling fans, I really like made it like my job to get some of this ring, like, you know, to get some of this ring of honor talent on, on, on different, on different shows, the Briscoe's on with the NBA and, and Austin, Austin Aries on with the NFL. And, um, and Mike G was like, Dave, you should really try to get a wrestling show on Sirius. And I was like, really? And I was like, can you, I mean, that seems a lot. And he's like, dude, like, you, you know, you're going to have, you're going to get ring of honor talent. So he was a big reason. He was a big motivation to push me to get this show up and running and to go up and present it to people because I could say, Hey, I have guests that I know will be able to come on this show. Did it, did it so much happen later on, but definitely, yeah. but definitely Mike G always went out of his way to get top. And I'm talking top talent with ring of honor, you know, um, like you said, the CM punks, the, the Brian Danielsons, the Claudio Castagnoli's, like the Kevin Steens, like those guys always came on early on on Sirius Radio. Yeah, and, and and I don't want to take too much time up about this, but it's just so classic. Wasn't the, the during the CM Punk Nana event, not his first one, but th that event I mentioned, isn't that when he pulled out the famous shrimp cocktail line? Y yes, it was. <laughs> I wonder if that's in the archive somewhere or on YouTube. You know what? It doesn't honestly, Carrie, it doesn't seem that long ago, but you're talking, you're talking now 16 years ago. Now it, it, it's crazy how time, where did the time, Dave, where did, the, where did the time go? It's, it's, it's insane. And that's why like with ring of honor and Carrie, you were a part of it, even leading up to uh, the big show at, at, with new Japan at Madison square garden, the Supercard. you orchestrated the big special that we had on busted open. And you brought up, uh, you know, you brought up Matt Taven and Dalton, you know, you, the, Dalton the castle and the Briscoes and Lethal. you were, uh, but listen, you were always great and, and being that bridge for this show. And I, and I'll, and I'll tell this story too. I remember Bobby Cruz wanting me to do a ring announcing for a match. And you were like, no, <laughs> you're not putting LaGreca in that ring. And you're like, you I know what? You're like, you I, know what? My brain went sour for a minute. And I was like, <laughs> Who's that? although I'd met you a number of times. I remember the first time you met me. And I remember you asking the producer and you're like, where's Dave LaGreca? And, and my producer, Mike Riker, pointed at me and you're like, that's Dave LaGreca? I remember that. I remember that like it was, you're like, that's Dave LaGreca? But um, but Ring of Ring of Honor is such a big part of the show's history, Busted Open's history. But just me as a fan. And like we talked about those venues and then ultimately, you know, the, Man, you know, the Manhattan Ballroom, the Hammerstein. Uh, just right. so many amazing events and, and amazing matches, um, you know, leading up to the garden. And I, I, and probably that's going to be like the tip in the top of the mountain was, you know, a sold out Madison square garden in 2019. Absolutely. Um, I, it's funny, you know, when things happen recently, like this past Saturday, um, it's fresher in your mind and how much bigger, how much more emotional, how much of a pinnacle can there be than Madison Square Garden? I don't know if there can be, but it almost felt, Dave, it almost felt that way Saturday. It was a different feeling. You know, the range of emotions that was going on at that place. It's like, I don't know, they say, you know, the, the, some people process things with sadness, some with anger, 
some with joyful memories. The whole the whole Megillah, as my Jewish grandmother would say, was there. And so for me at that show Saturday, I think I might have rather, of course, Madison Square Garden was the pinnacle of my of, of Ring of Honor and my perfect. Who would have ever thought that a guy who scalped tickets in front of Madison Square Garden regularly from that, I probably came across you then, and you're a little kid between 1986 and 1991, as well as other venues, and attended wrestling and concerts. Wrestling starting in 71, concerts starting in 73, Led Zeppelin and Houses of the Holy Tour, and I went to everything. I saw the school, I saw the 76, Welcome to My Nightmare at the Garden. Uh, I saw, we didn't care, I'll get to the point. We didn't care if it was Iron Maiden or Billy Joel. We didn't care if it was the Allman Brothers or Genesis. Point is, or we didn't care if it was the who, we wanted to go to see everything. And it was it was a beautiful time. But so the garden, for the, the chance of me getting a be sitting, be, be sitting at ringside and in the ring, presenting the belt to Matt Taven and getting to walk out. It's like the this is like hitting the, the not the lottery. It's like the Powerball. Yet Saturday night, this past Saturday, almost equaled it in a, just a different way. Um, uh, it was very special. The energy, Dave, the and I don't know. I, well, I do know because I watched it, I, you know, when I got, uh, when I recovered and I came home Sunday, the energy in the, uh, the energy in the building was much better than what was on TV, although it wasn't bad. <clears throat> Excuse me. It wasn't bad on TV, but in the building, it had that old ring of honor, Hammerstein, Manhattan Center, that we're all in this, and I'm not talking about the in back of the stage, in front. We're all in this together. And it was very overwhelming. And this is something that you are experiencing now. And I'm with, with your success with with and I'm really proud of you um, with your success with Busted Open. You know the feeling when you go to one of these events, like you're doing this Saturday in Philly, or you go to Texas. Uh, or wherever the hell you go, where, you know, people want to meet you. And, um, and or, or even if you're just there, all those people that come up to you, oh, excuse me, sir, uh, excuse me, Dave, uh, you know, ask you for an autograph. Can I get a selfie? And Saturday night was ridiculously overwhelming with, and the bulk, you know, you know, since I sold the company Sinclair to Sinclair, Baltimore was really our home base going back to the shows at the Dewburns Arena. And so a lot of the fans have been regulars. And there were some some of the old school fans, not a lot of them from, from the olden days, but a few, it was cool. But it was like such an outpouring of love and appreciation that it was super hard for me to process. And the guys in the back and the guys that thank me that, like Josh Woods, I'm just pulling a name out. He's only been around for four or five years, whatever. I mean, I don't know, in Ring of Honor. And he, I'm like, what do you mean, thank me? You know, he's like, whatever. If it wasn't for you, Bob, I'm like, stop already, stop. So it was super emotional. And I think that as a wrestling show, it delivered. I, I think it did too. And I think it went out on the right note. I thought it was... One of the best shows I've seen in a while. Uh, I was happy to talk about it the next day on Busted Open. Um, I sat there. I, it made me wish I was there. And I actually was kicking myself for not being there uh, because with the road that we've all taken as fans and we felt like we we're a part mm -hmm. of this company, it's going to be hard to get that feeling. You know, AEW is doing some amazing things and I'm a fan. But it's Absolutely. a big, it's big money, big production, you know, TV right away, 8 o'clock. Like Ring of Honor felt like we're getting right at the at, right at the footsteps, right at the beginning of the starting line with this company, and we saw it just grow and grow. And it, you know, a piece of me as a fan died, you know, last Saturday night uh, with Final Battle, 
And, you know, the final battle is, is true in its words because that might be. Because even if Ring of Honor comes back in April, which I hope that it does, it's going to be a, a completely different product than it was before. But, Carrie, that may not be a bad thing because there might be a new generation of fans that latches on it in April and starts that whole motion all over again. Yeah, it's it, this. This is a classic thing, Dave. That when something, it, let's just say, uh, oh, uh, the, the the Who are doing their last tour, which they've done about ten of their last yeah. concerts ever. But you know, it's like people want to go. There's talk. There's uh, th- there's buzz. And um, Bully Ray said it like, you know, where were the people before this? You know, now they're all coming out of the woodwork. But that's just the way it is in life. Um, what I wanted to say to you was, I am, as far as the wrestling I watch these days, um, despite my friendships to this day, and I'm talking about people I actually legitimately communicate, Seth Rollins, Tyler Black, Kevin Steen, Kevin Owens, Cesaro, uh, Sami Zayn, uh, Generico, and I'm leaving out names, but I can't watch WWE currently. I and I am I am a guy who has been watching any kind of damn wrestling since 1966. I was 10 years old. Everyone wants to calculate the old bastard. He's 65, <laughs> but you know, and it's like when I when I got to meet. I remember Dutch Mantel, who I knew from Puerto Rico, but we'll need about 10 podcasts. But real quick, Dutch Mantel said to me, Kiri. If you have a wrestling fan, a real wrestling fan, like I was and you are, you could have a piece of paper laying in the street that says wrestling. And they're going to be, you know, the point is I would watch any wrestling. I would buy every wrestling magazine. Uh, Now in this new era of, you know, YouTube podcasts, uh, there's so much wrestling to consume. Where I was going with this was, WWE, uh, I'm going to have to give it another chance. Maybe the Royal Rumble, right? That's always good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you probably should. It's hard. It's not like wrestling. You know, they 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 use the term sports entertainment, which right. is true. It's just not pro wrestling that you know f- that we grew up on. Um, but it's still there's enough of it that keeps me keeps me hanging on. You know, but you're well, hundred you're hundred percent right, Carrie. It would have when I was growing up. It didn't matter what it was. You know, and that was great with the explosion of cable TV is that I was able to get, you know, Florida and world class and WWF and Mid-Atlantic. And I had to watch Mid-Atlantic on Channel 47. So it was in Spanish. So I couldn't understand what Hugo Savinovich was saying, but it didn't matter. Florida champ, you know, Polynesian Pacific Championship Wrestling, like, (laughs) you know, that was on the financial network. Like, but you had to go was on sometimes at midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. It wasn't on 8 p.m. primetime TV like it is now. And I think now it's harder for a lot of companies because it's so easily accessible now that if you make it difficult on the consumer, they're not going to go out of their way to watch it. Well, what I was going to lead to with my with my backing off my you know love of WWE, um, I do really I, I really enjoy AEW. I Me record I, I record that the Wednesday show I record faithfully. Sometimes the Friday show I'm not, you know, I don't have but Wednesday I'm going to record it or if I'm home I might actually watch it live. Um and it's good. It's so good. You know, there there's so many of my friends there, but forget that. It's a good pro- it's a really good product. And but what I was going to ultimately say was as good as their full gear pay-per-views and they their all outs and I'm forgetting the other names and they're fabulous. I think the ring of honor show from eight to 11 that we just saw was as good or better just because it was shorter and the vibe and it, I don't know. I just thought that, uh, I, I'm very proud of what, what was presented. That yeah, night. and you should be. And Carrie, I, I just want to take the time uh, as we're wrapping up to thank you. Thank you for all the memories. Thank you for giving your heart and soul, your passion, 
uh, to the Ring of Honor company and to the fans and giving them and delivering a product that I, I think will last the ages and the generations and years to come. People will look back at what you were able to do in those prime years of Ring of Honor and it's going to be remembered. And I, and I, I'll always remember it and I will always talk about it because that's how much Ring of Honor meant to me. Well, I want to thank you for having me on. I mean, we could talk forever, but we'll do it. We'll, we'll do some more talking down the road, Dave. How about that? Yeah, def, there's no doubt about it. There's always I something mean, we, to talk about. We didn't about. even scratch. We didn't scratch. We, we didn't scratch anything, but I get it because there's too much. Let's just close with this. It's 20 years of rich, rich wrestling history. And pl- it's like a there was a here, I'll just, there was a Jethro Tull album in the 90s called Roots to Branches. And the you know, the 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 the, the, the roots of Ring of Honor as they grew and the branches went other places and the leaves, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm getting at. It's all over the landscape of pro wrestling. And that's a, that's pretty uh, uh, bully said it best himself yesterday. You know, at ECW, when it closed, some of the guys did very well, obviously, you know, like himself and uh, many others, but it didn't have the, uh, the grow, you know, it didn't blossom. How about that? No. And, and you look at the rosters of ring of honor and, and I'm, I'm a big program junkie. I love getting, and they don't really have them anymore, but Ring of Honor used to have the programs at the events and I used to buy, I have my programs and you look at those programs and those rosters throughout the years, they went on to, to work in some of the biggest companies in the world. And, but their beginning and maybe even some of their best matches were from Ring of Honor. Well, let's hope, uh, we'll, we'll be, uh, we'll be hanging out in Texas in April and uh, at another Ring of Honor show. If there's a show, I'll be there. Kerry, thank you so much for the time. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Busted Open is part of the SiriusXM Sports Podcast Network. Producers are very own diva Gabby Laspisa and Andre Viola. Sound designed by Mary Bayon. Andy King is the director of sports podcasting for SiriusXM. Special thanks to SiriusXM's senior vice president of sports programming and podcasting, Steve Cohen, and SiriusXM Fight Nation program director, Marissa Rivas. This is Jimmy Smith, voice of WWE Monday Night Raw and host of Unlocking the Cage on SiriusXM Fight Nation Channel 156. And I'm here to let you know that Unlocking the Cage is now available as a podcast. That's right. You'll get my take on the trending stories in combat sports and interviews with some of the biggest names in the fight game. I'm bringing you shows every Tuesday through Friday. Subscribe today wherever you get your podcasts or listen on the SXM app free for most subscribers extravaganza fun to say and fun to play now that's an everyday win play the 173 million dollar extravaganza scratcher for your chance to win up to 5 million dollars or 670,000 prizes ranging from 100 to 500 dollars everyday win are you in visit a lottery retailer near you for odds and more information visit valottery.com